coming, everybody. It's a great honor to be the first up to the podium and it's in such a distinguished panel and such a distinguished series. And uh, I'm glad I get out of the firing line as it were. First, um, let me say first that uh, what I'm actually going to speak about uh, at so often, at, for so long now, is the war in Iran. And for so many, as many of you who've been in the room where I've spoken about the war in Iran before uh, many times. Uh, and one of the things that occurred to me as I was preparing this talk was just how long it has been that we have been writing and talking and ha giving panels about this war. And it turns out that since 2003, according to the Library of Congress, there have been some 800 books published on the war in Iraq uh, in English, let alone uh, in other languages. And this is unfortunately and uncannily roughly equivalent to the number of suicide bombs that have been detonated in Iraq over that period. So, I'm not going to present some kind of solution. Uh, we're in the middle of this. This is by no means over. Uh, no matter who wins the debate, let alone who wins the election, I think we should not be under any illusions about what will happen if Barack wins. I mean, as much as I'm a huge Barack fan. Um, so, but the question, uh, I'm going to answer a much more specific question, one of the ones that uh, Saikia outlined at the start, which is to think about how the archive of war has been changed by the development of digital media and new media. Uh, and my answer, in short, because I doubt it all wants to write, you know, get, get the note down, is not so much um, by the media as by the way the war has become culture. And I just want to start with a little fact that in the first half of 2008, the Three major US news networks devoted a total of 181 minutes to coverage of the war, Iraq war in their nightly newscasts. That's a total for all three major networks. That's about 20 seconds a day. Now there is of course, there has been now about 130 journalists have been killed in Iraq since the beginning of the war. So there's an obvious reluctance to report. But what I want to mark here is you know, a third transition in the visual culture of the war. We began with a mass of heavily censored, often very banal, but immense quantities of imagery. This was the imagery that I mostly wrote about in watching Babylon, the official embedded reports that came back uh, from the invasion stage and the first coalition occupation stage of the war in Iraq. And we then moved into a second phase, uh, which has now begun to be written about and critically uh, discussed, which, would I, which I would say was the vernacular imagery phase <coughs> of the war. And I'm showing you, going to show you a few examples here. The, the, the Morgra Man, this is one of the most popular uh, photographic images uh, from the war, taken uh, on site. And it's a digital image, and you can find it on Flickr. Then you can see there's a very extensive archive of video on the Internet Archive that will allow you to look at a whole range of eyewitness video. And this is then a, dis a difference in this little war in which we have moving and still images taken by the participants, distributed via the Internet that are now accessible from both sides of the conflict. <coughs> so here, for example, I mean, we may very well have seen soldiers' videos. This is um, purports to be a video showing a uh, IED exploding in Iraq and uh, devastating this truck, which is about to enter stage left. And you know whether it's an Iraqi army truck or a American army truck or where this film was taken, it's of course open to question. There's now uh, an extensive series of work. People are beginning to do work on this kind of video, and I would recommend to you, if you're not familiar with it, this piece by Jennifer Terry that's on Vectors, which is this excellent online journal produced by my colleague Tara McPherson at USC. And she goes through a series of these soldier-generated videos and analyzes them, uh, and it's a great teaching tool, whether you are uh, teaching yourself or teaching others. So we have then this you know, very substantial body of internet generated, internet available imagery that we can talk about. But I think we have to mark a moment. This is the, most of this imagery is now of, of an age. 
uh, that finished roughly last year. The army started clamping down on the other way on soldiers having still cameras for rather obvious reasons. Uh, and they have subsequently been more restrictive about the distribution of even uh, rather banal video. So most of this video work uh, is 2007 at the latest. We seem now to have emerged into a new state, a seeming invisibility, that moment that I mentioned before, that there is no war on television, in the media. We are told that the surge has worked. We are down, in heavy inverted commas, to 25 attacks a day. In a country with a population of 20 million, that's roughly equivalent to the population of New York State. You might want to remember that when the French sent the paratroops into Algeria, they widely announced that there were four attacks a day going on in Algeria, which they described as intolerable. In the week ending of September 28, this past week, there were 169 civilian deaths in Iraq. So the war is over as a visual media narrative in the United States, but it's certainly not over in any substantial sense of the term. So we want them to start to frame this war again uh, in, a, in a new, in a, to think about what this new mode of invisibility means. Uh, and this is part of the project uh, that I am engaged in at present. And I want to think then about the whole status of the image uh, in relation to war, and to suggest that often the violent image is seen as, in some sense, an exception. It's like a breach of the peace. That the normal image ought to be peaceful. But I would argue that, to the contrary, that the normal image is necessarily, in the context of the world, <coughs> in the condition of visuality that we live in, always and already violent. The word visuality, as many of you know, uh, from uh, my recent argument of this over and over again, has been uh, invented by the Scottish philosopher and historian Thomas Carlyle, I'll show you Julia Margaret Cameron's photograph of him here. It's not blurry in the image, it was blurry, that's how she took pictures. Um, and Carlyle in 1840, in his essay on the hero, argued that visuality is what the hero has. It is, always is, top-down view of the world in which power visualizes history uh, for itself. And that modality of visuality is directly borrowed from the modalities of war in his own time. So this is the, a, a field map of Battle of Waterloo, 1815. And Napoleon was one of the great examples of the hero and of the visualizer in Carlisle. And the whole point then is that the battlefield exceeds the scope of normal biological vision. You can't see the battlefield. When the, Hero that wins will be the one who can most effectively visualize to himself how the battlefield actually looks. So Napoleon is famous for creating these feints and maneuvers that uh, make people think he's attacking at a certain place, and in fact, he's not. He's doing it somewhere else. Because they can see this body of soldiery, uh, they move towards it, and the victory comes to Napoleon. 